God's peace be with you all. Good morning and welcome to Trinity Aurora and St. James the Apostle and Sharon's joint service. Just a couple of announcements. A reminder that we have uh, Compline on Zoom Tuesday evenings if you're interested in joining us. And uh, Wednesday evenings during Lent at 7.30, we have sung Book of Common Prayer Evensong. And please uh, join us at that service as well. Uh, I have a very exciting announcement for St. James. I understand this Sunday at one o'clock is your vestry by Zoom. So you don't wanna miss it, it should be exciting. I think anyways. All the best at your vestry meeting will keep you in our prayers. Let us take a moment of silence as we prepare for worship. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all and also with you. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, whose Son was revealed in majesty before he suffered death upon the cross, give us faith to perceive his glory, that being strengthened by his grace, we may be changed into his likeness from glory to glory, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. A reading from St. Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 4, verses 13 through 25. The promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is 
the adherents of the law, who, to be, who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends on faith, in order that the promise to rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham, for he is the father of all of us. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of God, in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations according to what was said, so numerous shall be your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was but a, a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore, his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words, it is reckoned to him, were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. Listen for the leading of the Spirit. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Then Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel, will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The Gospel of Christ. And now may the words of my lips and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing to you, O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. It has been a whole year since the world was turned upside down. One year of disaster, disease, heartbreak, and horror. One year since we've all been able to live with many of the freedoms and conveniences that we once took for granted. This year for Lent, I've been encouraging people to be really gentle with themselves. This isn't necessarily the year to take on a really difficult fast, unless it's something that will help you to connect really deeply with God. But if taking on a difficult Lenten discipline is going to make you feel even more bereft on top of what we've already experienced this year, just don't do it. 
A Lenten discipline isn't a punishment. It's a practice that draws us into the heart of God and helps us to grow to be more like Jesus and focuses our attention on God's will for the world. Lenten disciplines don't only have to be about taking something away either. There are lots of additive disciplines that help us to connect our, to our spiritual strength and enable us to live in the peace and confidence that our sure and certain hope in the promises of God are well placed. This year, I hope that any discipline we take on will remind us of who we are, beloved of God, transformed by God's love, and made witnesses to the life and love that is revealed in Jesus. I pray that we will pay attention to God's spirit of gentleness leading us through this difficult time. And it's with all this in mind that I turned to the gospel reading from Mark in which we are told to take up our cross and follow Jesus. In the call to take up our crosses, I believe we're being invited to embrace others in their pain and brokenness as Jesus embraces us. I think that there's something really important about standing with each other and supporting each other in our painful experiences rather than just trying to explain them away or make excuses for them or simply crying out against them. As we're gentle and loving with each other and embrace each other in these times, we also learn to trust together that God is in the midst of all of our pain and brokenness, working with us and for us and calling us to life. They say that all of us have been in the same storm over the past year, but in different boats. The global pandemic, the terrifying escalation of racism, and the political turmoil of the past year are things that we've all endured in different ways and to varying degrees. And sadly, there are many other difficult experiences that we also have in common. Many of us have felt the sting of betrayal by someone that we trusted. We've lost loved ones through death or estrangement. We've worried about our finances, our health, our safety. We've had dreams dashed. And in this Black History Month, we need to remember and acknowledge that too many have felt the weight of oppression and prejudice stopping them from experiencing abundant life. In this world, to live is to struggle at times. And yet, for the most part, we don't like to display our brokenness for others to see. We tend to hide those most vulnerable parts of our lives, maybe because we're embarrassed or we wonder if people will still respect us if we show our vulnerabilities. Maybe we're afraid people will take advantage of us if they see our weakness. It could also be that we don't want our pain to overwhelm us, so we push it all into a box and we shove it down where we only have to deal with it every once in a while. However we deal with it, from situation to situation, we tend to favor strength over weakness, health over sickness, and self-sufficiency over dependence, or at least the illusion of these things. But while these tendencies are understandable, they stop us from fully bearing witness to the good news of the gospel, and they prevent us from becoming the people that we are called to be. One of my favorite writers, David Lowe, said, we are called to take up our cross by being honest about our brokenness and thereby demonstrate our willingness to enter into the brokenness of others. We're called to take up our cross because we follow the one who not only took up his cross, but also revealed that nothing in this world, not even the hate and darkness and death that seemed so omnipresent on that Friday we dare call good, can defeat the love and light and life of God. Denying pain and sadness, weakness and brokenness is understandable. It's a common human trait. Peter did it. He was flabbergasted at, it, at even the possibility 
that God's Messiah came to suffer and die rather than conquer and rule. So he rebuked Jesus. Peter looked for God in places of, and positions of strength. So the idea that Jesus would suffer and die were things that he felt should be avoided at all cost because he could not imagine God there. They seemed to him to be literally God-forsaken places, those places of suffering. And what he didn't understand is that it was in the cross that God demonstrated that there is no place that God would refuse to go in the quest to love and redeem us. So today, I hope we all know that it's okay to not be okay. It's okay to be loving and honest and gentle with ourselves, and in turn to be loving and honest and gentle with others who are hurting. And knowing that, we can affirm that the pain, brokenness, and death of the world does not have the last word that God is with us in those times and in those places, calling us back to courage, hope, and life through the cross and into resurrection. Our resurrection life will take shape in different ways for all of us. It may lead us to stand more clearly with marginalized people against violence and prejudice. We may be called to embrace and walk with someone who is critically or chronically ill. Perhaps it will be to do the holy work of holding the hand of one who is facing death. Perhaps it will be to respond to a call for action when action needs to be taken. Or even as we come together as communities of faith to be gentle and loving with each other, as we make important life-giving spirit-filled decisions in our annual vestry meetings, our advisory, or other leadership meetings. Whatever decisions we make, whatever issues we face, we stand together in love and in pursuit of abundant life. God has shown us time and time again that we can't stand with people by standing over them. We meet people most authentically and meaningfully when we embrace them and acknowledge the things that we have in common. That's what was shown to us in the incarnation. Jesus became one of us to love us and redeem us. Jesus also showed us that God is not absent from us or disinterested in us, but wants to be intimately and powerfully present with us in our brokenness. And in doing so transforms our experiences and encourages us in our struggles. Today, in whatever state we find ourselves, in whatever pain or weakness or brokenness, know that God is committed to join us there. As we take up our crosses, may God's love move us from death into life so that we may be transformed and emboldened to embrace others and be with them through the process that leads to the life of love and abundance to which God calls every human being. Amen.
Let us confess the faith of our baptism as we say. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. With confidence and trust, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. For the one holy Catholic and apostolic church throughout the world, we pray to you, Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the mission of the church, that in faithful witness it may preach the gospel to the ends of the earth, we pray to you, Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Linda, our primate, Anne, our metropolitan, Andrew, our diocesan, and Kevin, our area bishop, and for all the clergy and people, we pray to you, Lord. Lord, have mercy. For peace in the world, that a spirit of respect and reconciliation may grow among nations and people, we pray to you, Lord. Lord, have mercy. God, we give you thanks for showing us time and time again that we can't stand with people by standing over them, that we must meet people most authentically and meaningfully, embrace them and acknowledge the things we have in common. Give us the courage and strength to be your bearers of light. We pray to you, Lord. Lord, have mercy. We pray for the sick and the suffering. And I invite you now, aloud on your lips or silently in your heart, to pray for those who need our prayers. Gracious God, the comfort of all who sorrow, the strength of all who suffer, hear the cry of those in need and show them mercy and give us, we pray, the strength to serve them. We pray to you, Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who have died, rest eternal grant unto them, O Lord, and may light perpetual shine upon them. May their souls and the souls of all the departed rest in peace and rise with the saints in glory. We pray to you, Lord. Lord, have mercy. As we take up our crosses, may God's love move us from death into life so that we may be transformed and emboldened to embrace others and be with them through the process that leads to the life of love and abundance to which God calls every human being. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy. God welcomes sinners and invites them to this table. Let us confess our sins confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our saviors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. The peace of the Lord be always with you.
Let us pray. God of wisdom, may the light of the eternal word, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, guide us to your glory. We ask this in his name. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Blessed are you, gracious God, creator of heaven and earth. We give you thanks and praise through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was tempted in every way yet did not sin. By his grace, we are able to triumph over every evil and to live no longer for ourselves alone, but for him who died for us and rose again. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven and all who have raised our voices to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We give you thanks, Lord our God, for the goodness and love you have made known to us in creation, in calling Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him, you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him, you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, a death he freely accepted, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he'd given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink this all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, you do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, Father, according to his command, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we made acceptable in him may be sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, reconcile all things in Christ and make them new, and bring us to that city of light where you dwell with all your sons and daughters, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation, by whom and with whom and in whom. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. As our Savior taught us, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. We break this bread, communion in Christ's body once broken. Let your church be the wheat which bears its fruit in dying. If we have died with him, 
we shall live with him. If we hold firm, we shall reign with him. Behold who you are, become what you receive, the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I invite you now to receive Christ into your hearts by faith with thanksgiving, and join with me in the following prayer. I worship and adore you, Lord Jesus Christ, present in the holy sacrament and in your people who are gathered in spirit. In this moment, I join with them to receive you in my heart and in our community. May you, enthroned upon the altar, be now enthroned in my heart. May you, present in bread and wine, feed and renew my soul. May you, who give yourself to us again, fill us with grace and heavenly benefit. Even as I am fed, may my hunger for you and your reign of justice and peace increase, that I may, with your spirit, Work for that day when your reign shall come on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Let us pray. Creator of heaven and earth, we thank you for these holy mysteries, which bring us now a share in the life to come. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.